Special thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. This is the Ultimate Attack Helicopter, a true masterpiece. Well, it was supposed to be. With double the rotors and firepower to match, this aircraft is considered among many to be the final evolution of the perfect modern day cavalry. Built as the answer to the legendary Apache, it promised so much for the Soviet Air Force and allowed Karmov to finally prove itself as the true innovation giant of the Soviet aircraft industry, despite rival Mill stabbing them in the back. However, while the Car 52 ended up doing exactly what it was made for, fighting American-made armor, its very high loss rate in Ukraine, operational problems, and ridicule in the media have made it anything but. This is the most controversial helicopter flying today, an engineering miracle of flight, desperately holding onto its crown. It's the early 80s, music is still great, Indiana Jones is in the cinemas, and on the tarmac of the Karmov Bureau's test facility, a new concept helicopter is taking to the skies for the first time. The main Soviet attack helicopter during the 70s was the Mi-24, also known as the Crocodile. But it was not a dedicated attack helicopter, rather a transport attack helicopter hybrid. And when Hughes unveiled their AH-64 in 1975, a specialized anti-armor helicopter, the Soviets realized that they had some work to do. You see, the Americans had gone in a completely different direction with the AH-64 design, radically different from the Cobra that had come before. It was powered with two engines to increase power and survivability, and they were positioned on each side of the fuselage. The Russians, Mi-24 on the other hand, although a twin-engine helicopter much the same, had its engines positioned next to each other on top of the cargo compartment and hitting one in combat meant that the other one was likely to be damaged as well. Thus, the desperate Soviets started a new attack heli program in the early 70s, but it was dormant until the new threat was revealed from the West. The usual suspects, Karmov and the Mill Design Bureaus, started to work on an answer to the American Apache. Mill with a pedigree and several very successful projects so far under their belt had the upper hand and went with a very similar design to the Apache, a twin-seater with separate engines and anti-tank weaponry. But Karmov realized that their only chance of winning the contract would be to come up with something completely different. They started by pulling out their already developed coaxial rotor designs for their Navy helicopters like the Car 27 and proposed something similar. Now, you're probably wondering what exactly is so special about a coaxial rotor anyway? Well, in a traditional design, as the rotor spins on a helicopter and creates lift, a counter force pushes the whole fuselage in the other direction. And that's why a tail rotor is introduced as a means to counter that force in the opposite movement and stabilize the aircraft. As the lift is generated, the engines provide further thrust to move the aircraft in any direction. So now you understand that if the tail rotor is damaged, helicopters generally enter an uncontrollable spin and is doomed to crash. Now the twin main rotor, or the coaxial rotor design, has its rotors spinning in opposite directions, eliminating the counter force that pushes the fuselage. Also eliminated the need for a tail rotor, and in case of even losing the whole tail surface, a helicopter can still land safely. Something that is going to come back in a big way by the end of the video. But apart from that, the twin rotors also create more lift and allow for much better maneuverability in flight. But Karmov didn't stop there. This was supposed to be the ultimate attack helicopter after all. In the words of chief designer Sergei Mikheyev, the most expensive part of the helicopter is, well, the pilot. Therefore, the new V-80 only had one pilot because they needed to spare on experience. But exactly this choice will come back to haunt this project some 15 years later and almost cancel the whole design. 
However, not only did they try to minimize the casualties in case of losing a helicopter, it was also equipped with an ejection seat, which was a novelty in the helicopter world, although a standard in the world of aviation by that point. It was one of the other rare Soviet projects where everything was survivability and pilot oriented. This new helicopter was envisioned not only as an attack helicopter, but also as a portable anti-air system, because it was equipped with short-range anti-air missiles and was to provide support against enemy helicopters and low-flying planes on the battlefield. Which if you think about, is totally insane to see a helicopter go up against jets. But this actually makes sense in a way, because a helicopter would be very hard for enemy jets to target on longer distances. But with time, the design changed and the focus was moved towards a classic attack helicopter role with a specialization in anti-armor tactics. New Hellfire missiles developed in the mid 80s pushed the Soviets towards development of a similar weapon too. And thus, in 1990, Karmov was green-lighted by the government and the first batch of helicopters was being built. The Ka-52 is strongly considered to be one of the best helicopters ever built, sold around the world. But I honestly believe that they could have made more sales if Karmov had used a Squarespace website. But before you jump ahead on the timeline, I'll sneak in some previews for you for our next video here, just like Squarespace snuck in the awesome Fluid Engine website builder. You start with a best-in-class website template and you get to customize every design detail with a reimagined drag and drop technology for desktop and mobile. So you don't actually need to make two websites for both platforms. You can also stretch your imagination online with the Fluid Engine, which is built in and ready to go with every new Squarespace site. Plus, that's not the only thing that they have, as every Squarespace website can have a built-in e-commerce shop to start selling right away, or you can use the campaign marketing tools to start driving business instantly. I actually use Squarespace myself personally for my online store, which is found in explain.shop. So thanks, Squarespace. So if you want to support the channel and see more animations just like this, but also make a business online and start selling right away and get 10% off your first site on domain, go to www.squarespace.com found. I know when you think planes, you think found and explained, but now when you think websites, think Squarespace. But in most of our stories that take place in this era, this little key event happened in 1991. That's right, the collapse of the USSR. Picking up from the ashes in 1992, the now new Russia presented the new attack helicopter to the world at an air show in England. Officially called the Car 50, this new aircraft soon got a nickname, the Black Shark, for its mean looks and black paint job. It presented itself as the next generation of attack helicopters with extreme maneuverability and survivability, overshadowing a fancy piece of weaponry which was also critical for this program to succeed, called the 9K-121 Vikur missiles. And boy, I have to tell you just how great these laser guided missiles were. They had a range up to 12 kilometers and paired with the new automated targeting system, they would be a perfect weapon against armor. These missiles were also part of the Su-25T, a tank killer upgrade, which we mentioned before in our Su-25 video. After the pilot finds a target, they would just have to mark it with their eyesight and launch a missile. Targeting, guiding and everything else was automated and require no further input from the pilot. This would mean that both the Su-25T and the Car 50 would be a single seater and still not have to have another pilot. This development was so good that just one year later, the Mi-28 was cancelled by the Russian government because it was deemed inferior to the Car 50, as well as lacking the radar and ability to fly missions during the night and in bad weather conditions. It seemed for Karmov and the Car 50, it was well on its way to glory. During the testing phase, some issues with the design started to pop up, especially with the decision to have only one pilot. During one of the tests, the pilot was tasked with finding and destroying 25 hidden targets on the range whilst flying low and evading enemy air defenses. The Mi-28 scored 24 out of 25 hits, but the Car 50 only scored one. 
The pilot could not operate both the aircraft and the precision weaponry at the same time while performing low-level flight, and spent most of its time trying to invade the AA and not crash, and it couldn't even spot the targets. During the Chechen Wars, the Ka-50 had its first combat deployment. Fast, maneuverable, and with a state-of-the-art weaponry, it performed well, but it was still extremely hard to operate for the pilots, and it flew missions along with Ka-29s because it failed to reach the mission goals by itself. Something that didn't go unnoticed by Mill. They decided to take their previous design, the Mi-28, and thoroughly update it to the Mi-28N variant, which was presented to the Russian military again, now with radar, updated optoelectronics, and new weaponry. And soon after the war, the Russian government decided to scrap the Car 50 program and instead buy this new Mi-28 version for the Air Force, a shocking betrayal that put Karmov on the back step. But they had one more ace up their sleeve. Back during the prototype phase, another two-seater variant was being developed for recon purposes and to act as the command helicopter on the field, supplying data and targeting information to other helicopters. And this is exactly what the new Car 52 would be based off. Apart from its tail rotorless design, the Car 52 would have the new VK2500 engines that had better payload capacity, climbing speed, overall speed, and maneuverability than the American Apache. Unlike both the Apache and the Car 50 with four underwing pylons for weaponry, this one would have six. It was also equipped with a radar like the Apache D or the Longbow variant and the Mi-28N for terrain mapping and targeting. It was also equipped with the Veitbisk or President S missile defense system, which has a 360 degrees coverage and detects and automatically launches flares against IR guided missiles. But let's talk weapons, and this is where it gets cool. Its main weapon would be those laser guided missiles and a massive targeting recon turret below the nose section that could shoot 360 degrees. But apart from that, it also has a 30mm cannon and can also carry unguided missiles, but that's pretty standard stuff. So why has 25% of the entire fleet already been destroyed? Let's dive in to the war in Ukraine and the role of the Ka-52. Now, this is where the discussion of the war in Ukraine gets a little bit controversial, and I want to point out the minefield that it is to talk about the performance of certain weapon systems. So I don't really want to get into the politics of the battle, but I just want to talk about the actual statistics that we have about the Car 52, specifically how it's performed in combat. According to the OSINT list, which is obviously unfinished so far because the war is still ongoing, it is stated that out of 220 confirmed helicopter kills, 210 are Car 52. If you take into consideration that not every missile launch or hit was published, the actual number probably goes much higher. For comparison, the US sources state that the Apaches had some 500 kills during the Gulf War, and that's without photo or video evidence. But in total, over 270 helicopters were performing combat flights, compared to a total of 120 cars 52s in service, which are probably less than 100 performing actual combat missions. This gives a combat performance at very comparable levels to the Apache, but the huge difference is in the number of helicopters lost, so let's also talk about the elephant in the room. Out of some 125 helicopters in the Ukraine theater, 34 have been lost to Ukrainians either in the air or on the ground. That's the same amount of Apaches the US Army lost during the seven years of war and insurgency in Iraq from 2003 to 2010, and 15 of those were lost to hostile fire. The high attrition rates are due to several factors. 
First and foremost, the Russians were performing extremely poorly in the first phase of the Ukrainian war. The Ka-52, the most sophisticated and expensive helicopter in the Russian Air Force, was flying missions in the contested airspace with unguided rocket pods. Simply stupid. The Americans learnt this the hard way during the Gulf War, where during one of the attacks, out of 33 attacking Apaches, one was shot down and 30 returned with heavy damage. The Americans realised that these helicopters needed to be used much more carefully, relying on Hellfire missiles and superior mid-range attacks. It took the Russians almost a year to learn this. But let's go back to the purpose of this helicopter, its specialised anti-armour platform with a role of commanding helicopter transferring data and recon info to other units in the field. During the Ukrainian counter-offensive, the performance of the Car 52s was put to the test, with long-range shots up to 9km away putting them out of the range of the Ukrainian anti-air systems, and being suppressed near the front lines so the Car 52s can operate at any time. The Car 52 is used exactly as it was envisioned, and now the losses are minimal in the past two months. Its defense systems are also being used to defend against rockets extremely well, but it also has some problems. Take a look at this video from Syria. Attack is Leva, Gepard. Attack is Zadia, Roland. The system is informing the pilot that it's been painted by Gepard and Roland AA systems, neither of which are in operation in Syria. And there are videos where it successfully defends itself from even two missiles, but when the flares run out, the Car 52 is a sitting duck, especially where there are dozens of man pads everywhere at any one time. Another issue with the Car 52 is the strong vibrations it suffers when carrying heavy payloads, therefore restricting the amount of weapons it can carry in a single mission. This might be due to bad maintenance, wear and tear, or simply design issues that were never fixed. But last and not least, unlike Hellfire missiles or the new Russian LMURs, its current missiles are not fire and forget weapons, and the helicopter either has to maintain position or very slowly move whilst the missiles are being guided. This has led to Ukrainians shooting down Car 52s with Stugner's PATGMs, which is something you would only imagine happening in a video game. On the other hand, ejection seats have saved pilots on several occasions, doing their job and saving them from almost certain death. Recently, we got real proof of the missing tail survivability theory. One helicopter was damaged and lost its almost whole tail section and managed to land safely. Going into the future, Russia has started to upgrade the Car 52 with something called the Car 52M. This modernized version will have new imaging and targeting modules under the nose paired with a now modern AESA radar. The LMUR or Isdalia 305 missiles that we mentioned, which are currently only available for the Mi-28, will be included for the Car 52 as well. They are true fire and forget missiles that are either passive or active guidance to the target. This new M variant is also getting new sensors and updated missile defense based off experiences during the war, and we can assume that something will be done about those vibration issues. To sum it all up, the Car 52 weapons platform is by no means a bad helicopter. The M variant will solve a couple of problems and make it even deadlier with new weapon options. But unfortunately, we all know how it's going to be used. And on that unfortunate depressing note, I want to thank you for watching today's video of Found and Explained. I hope that you found this video, the history and the analysis interesting, and despite all the political issues, I hope we can appreciate the hard work that the engineers made to make such an incredible flying machine. A beautiful helicopter that has an awful purpose.